right. So uh, uh, good afternoon. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Ali Kujuri. Uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, attending this uh, uh, this uh, 11th uh, lecture since the beginning of the year and 146 lectures since the since we started the lecture series in 2006. Uh, I would like to uh, to uh, thank Sharon Maribani, who is not here, and then also uh, uh, Kate uh, Lapp, who in fact are helping me in uh, arranging this uh, lecture series. So uh, before we start uh, uh, introducing our guest speaker for today, let me mention that uh, first of all, uh, the, the Kate has uh, ordered pizza, which is going to arrive at uh, 5.30, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, next, uh, uh, the, there will be a class uh, starting at 6 o'clock here, so I would like to ask you to uh, leave uh, maybe a cup, maybe one or two minutes before uh, 6 o'clock so that we can clean the room for the, for the lecture. The next uh, uh, lecture will be on Thursday, April the 18th, titled The Advanced Light Source at, uh, at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab Beamline Science Design and Control by Dr. Corey Ralston, Head Berkeley Center for Instructional Biology and Scientist, Livermore, uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National uh, uh, Laboratory in California. Our guest speaker for today is uh, Dr. Rajiv D. And the title of his talk is uh, Passive Optical Networks. Technology for Broadband Access to the Home. Dr. Rajiv uh, Dig manages Broadcom's fiber-based home gateways and is based in Petaluma, California. Rajiv got his PhD in electrical engineering from University of Notre Dame and has been uh, working on Broadcom networks ever since. He has started at at and Laboratories in Homedale, New Jersey followed by NEC, uh, that's the Nippon Electric Company, you know, uh, research center in Princeton, New Jersey, where his work led to a startup, to a startup on Broadcom, uh, sorry, on broadband access multiplexers called the uh, Ulix Networks that uh, he headed as the uh, uh, chief technology officer. He then moved to the semiconductor industry working at uh, Globes, Globescan and uh, Connexant, uh, and finally Broadcom. So here is Dr. Rajiv Lee. Thank you so much, uh, Ali, for getting me over. And I'm happy to talk about this technology that's been, um, been around for almost 10 years. It's really creating a lot of momentum worldwide. Uh, Broadband to the home is pretty much now a national or a government initiative in most of uh, the world. And passive optical networks is viewed as the technology at this point to get there. So what I'll talk about today is uh, what are the market drivers for this technology? Uh, what is the technology in terms of uh, the standards? Uh, 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 critically move where it is going and uh, uh, some key uh, deployment models that are being pursued all over the world. And um, uh, Ali had asked me to talk a little bit about the company uh, before, so I'll start with uh, a brief introduction to Broadcom. So, um, uh, like all uh, major companies or major high-tech companies uh, in, in North America, we are uh, basically a product of a series of mergers. So uh, at and Bell Labs uh, went to Lucent Technologies. Uh, the microelectronic version of, of that was called Agare, and that got acquired by LSI Logic. Um, HP, really pretty much a pioneer in um, high-tech, um, uh, uh, 
So the HP labs became Agilent Technologies, which based out of Santa Rosa, and then a, became a part of Avago, which then IPO'd, and then they acquired LSI Logic, and then Broadcom began as a pretty much a organic startup out of UCLA. Uh, Dr. Henry Samuel Lee was uh, the founder, the professor at UCLA. Uh, he had a student called Henry Nichols. The two of them started Broadcom around 91, uh, did a series of acquisitions on its own. One of them was Technovus that was in Petaluma, an Epon company in 2010. I was a part of that group and finally we formed this company called Broadcom which is a combination of all these companies that, that were uh, sort of acquired or merged in the middle. Uh, what are our products? I mean we have core technologies, uh, broadband, Qualm were a lead uh, provider of set-top boxes and uh, cable modems. Uh, also, um, the original Avago had a very rich <coughs> a mixed signal technologies uh, uh, like the F-bar and RF and pretty much every smartphone in, in the world has uh, a, a component from Broadcom uh, in it. Uh, we have technology in SIRDES, optics, optical sensing, uh, which led to a bunch of products, uh, set-top boxes, cable modems, Pond DSL modems, Ethernet controllers, filters, wireless connectivity, um, very strong switching history. All the data center switching and all the core network switching are all mostly out of Broadcom. My um, CTO made once an interesting comment. He said that 99% uh, of all the bits in the world and the, uh, that are in the, on the internet will go through at least one Broadcom device uh, in their path from the data center to the home. And somebody asked him, why do you come up with 99.9%? .9 and he said, uh, if I said 100%, my lawyers would be after me. So, uh, but pretty much pervasive. I mean, we've got, uh, we've got products all over the place. Uh, so basically, we have three, four groups. Actually, it's become five now. Uh, this is a little dated. There's a wired piece that I'm a part of. There's a wireless piece that's sitting in every uh, you know, Wi-Fi device or a Bluetooth device on your iPhone, on your Samsung. There's enterprise storage, industrial. And we went and acquired a software company called CA uh, that's now providing enterprise software and as well as mainframe software. So. Uh, we are diversifying and, uh, and uh, doing well in everything. So uh, in terms of um, hiring, we are hiring people who are into software. We are hiring people into VLSI. My team in Petaluma is mostly uh, VLSI, Pawn software, so passive optical network, both on the CO side and the CP side, as well as um, the, the team that does SQA, so all the quality work. We have a much bigger group in San Jose, Zanker, a huge facility um, that does all the network switching software, the Wi-Fi, uh, as well as some of the broadband access. All right, uh, so let me talk a little bit about my group. This is the Broadband Carrier Access Group. Uh, it's composed of um, these components. There is the Wi-Fi piece, that's all in, my, in our group. There's the DSL CPE, there's the PON CPE. Uh, this is on the CPE side, so this is all inside the home, the connected home. And then there's, on the CO side, we have SOCs that go into the DSLAMs and the OLTs. So pretty much the entire broadband access, uh, if you will, is under this group, which is called as broadband carrier access. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's been uh, since 2004 we've been shipping, and uh, you can see ADSL, VDSL, uh, and then PON, and we've shipped. Uh, this is 2018, we were at around 900 million C CPEs that we've shipped. We're over a billion now, so uh, 
very mature uh, product line. Uh, pretty much all over the world, you can see the world map here. On, you can see the different carriers, uh, so a little bit, in, but pretty much um, it's a global presence. So it's the number one supplier of DSL, PON, Wi-Fi, VoIP, and Ethernet silicon. Okay, let's go back to PON, and I'll first start with uh, what's the end game. So basically the idea is that you've got the internet, and you need to get some way to get into the house. A wireline is the popular one. There's also some fixed wireless, like uh, on the 60 gigahertz channel. But let me talk about the three main ones. Uh, it's fiber, so fiber comes into the home or it's twisted pair, so you've got DSL coming into the home, or it's coax, which is cable coming to the home. The basic idea here is that uh, uh, then you've got all the home networking technologies, so inside the house you've got the set-top boxes, PCs, cameras, game systems, uh, network storage, laptop, all kinds of things, mobile phones. And the basic idea is that we deliver broadband to the home, and then the home networking technologies such as Mocha, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, DLNA, home plug, all of them basically distributes it inside the home. So that's basically the way this thing is framed. Get a big fat pipe into the home, and then find all these applications that you run on your devices in the home, and find a way to distribute it. So uh, why, are, why are the carriers doing this? The problem is that uh, if you look at just providing data or voice, uh, there's no money there. It's, a voice is now almost writing for free. There's nothing going on. Uh, you pay a lot of money to install fiber. If a fiber is not easy to install, uh, two ways you have to dig and get a bunch of permissions or go in the air on, on the poles, but it's, just, it's, it's, it's expensive, right? Uh, just by bringing bandwidth to the home, it's not going to be able to, uh, you're not going to make your money as a carrier. What you need to do is find a way to monetize the fact that the traffic into the home is increasing, but the revenues, if you stayed with the main mainstream services, you're not going to be able to pay for it. So Google was the one actually that started it. I'm seeing that with everybody else, that it's all about this here, adding new services, uh, triple play, 4K TV, uh, Wi-Fi, surveillance, cloud computing, business services. You have to keep adding services, and the services are where you're going to make money. So Google basically, when they did Google Fiber, was essentially that they wanted to provide the pipe for free, but then make money on all the Android apps that, that they were going to run. And video was the play for them, because you bring in the bandwidth, and you find a way to consume the bandwidth, and that's how you're going to monetize the whole thing. And it's, a, it's pretty much true with all the carriers now that uh, they are bringing a big fat pipe into the home, and then finding ways to monetize it. And in a way, it's a refreshing change because when we, we grew up, me, Ali, it was the old-fashioned uh, circuit switch networks and everything was metered and you came in 32 kilobits per second or 64 kilobits per second or the data was at 9.6 kilobits per second. Uh, if you're lucky, most times uh, f uh, even lower speeds. Uh, uh, and the, the carriers to be very stingy with their bandwidth. So. Everything was metered, and if you needed more, you needed to pay more money. And, and then suddenly there was this new fresh concept that, hey, it's, um, we need to change our mindset. We need to start thinking not like a carrier, but we need to start thinking uh, like the electric company. The electric company gives electricity to the home and then lets you use it. And the more you use it, the more they charge you for it. So subtle change, bring the bandwidth in, don't charge for the bandwidth, but charge for services running on that bandwidth. So, uh, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a very refreshing change uh, that, that uh, the carriers are now pursuing. 
Uh, the other thing that's happening, and uh, for a long time, there used to be two networks. There was a fixed network, so you got the residents, the, best, the business, uh, metros, and then, uh, so this was the fixed network, and there was a wireless network. And uh, you had the backhaul, uh, the, beat, the towers, and all of that, and these were two different networks. So if you talk to kind of Verizon, the Verizon wireless was different from the Verizon wired. Uh, at some point, some people realized that, hey, this is kind of silly. This is high OPEX and CAPEX for running two different networks. So the convergence was to say that, now I'm going to run everything on one wired backbone, both wireless services and wired services, and essentially basically take advantage of a big fat pipe that's running all over the place, and then provide services like 1588 is needed if you go from a circuit switching network to a packet network uh, and back, and uh, essentially use fiber as the connection for all of that. So for instance, Verizon is now working on something called a One Fiber Initiative. It's all ng pond 2 based And they're basically taking all their services essentially on one fiber. And this is the way they're gonna actually converge everything over fiber, provide triple play services, uh, 5G now is becoming huge. So uh, when we first started Fios uh, back in 2007, uh, Verizon was only doing Fios in Northeast. So, you know, the way things were set up, Verizon was in Northeast and AT&T was other places. So uh, it was a very regional play, uh, reasonable size, about maybe three to five million subscribers, but very regional. Today, when with the 5G services, now Verizon is talking about putting an ONU or, an, uh, or a PON subsystem in every base station in the Verizon wireless networks. Now, you think about it, suddenly the, the, the TAM has grown to a nationwide TAM because Verizon wireless is everywhere, right? And suddenly the amount of uh, nodes you're going to need is going to increase. So in from a uh, semiconductor perspective, it becomes that much more attractive that you can actually get to maybe a 100 million, 200 million uh, range, it's over three to five million range. And again, for us, everything is about volumes right now. Uh, so again, the vision is um, 5G, LTE, carrier Wi-Fi, uh, broadband, all on the same, same fiber. Okay, so let's go into a technology tutorial. Um, Multiple ways for an access network to work. So here's a simple one. You have homes. You've got point-to-point -point Ethernet, and you come to a central office, and you have a big fat switch here. It's point-to-point, -point, so one-to-one, -one, and each, each uh, home is now connected to one port on the CO. Uh, leads to multiple problems, the most important one being that the CO suddenly becomes very port constraint, right? Because if you have 500 homes, you're gonna need 500 ports on the switch inside the CO. It also leads to something called as um, uh, conduit exhaustion. You can see the number of fibers they have put in there and they're just running out of fibers because uh, it's, it's one to one, right? it's, not, it's not scaling. And hence the whole fiber management in the CO suddenly becomes a problem. So this is your point to point solution. Uh, the next one is to sort of move it a little bit. So you take that CO, move it out to a remote OLT or, uh, or a, a remote site. Again, run Active Ethernet here. So you have a switch in the field. Not <coughs> optimal because suddenly you are now putting active electronics in the middle of the field. You've got all kinds of maintenance issues and things like that that goes with it. Uh, if this thing goes down, there's a battery backup issue, uh, I mean a power backup issue and all of that. So again, uh, better than the previous one, but still not optimal. So somebody decided, hey, I'm gonna have a purely passive network inside the, uh, in the, in the, this thing and put only the electronics at the end of it. And that was basically what PON is. PON is essentially a distributed switch. So you basically are running fiber, and then you use a passive splitter here. So you can do like a 32 to one split, or a 64 to one split, or a 16 to one split, 
or a 128 to 1 split. And it's a passive split. So what the splitter is doing is it's costing you about 3 dB of power because of the split. But essentially, it's a point to multipoint system. So one port here can do up n ports here, right? So you've taken care of that fiber exhaustion problem as well as the port constraint problem inside the seal. Uh, also, the beauty is it's all passive. So there is no active electronics here, right? So this is the basic uh, basis of a POM system, a point to multipoint system. And then what they do is put a protocol around it. So in a way, uh, the, this is a distributed switch, if you will. The brains of the system is all on the OLT side. But the ONU is essentially, uh, if you will, a remote line card, if you will. So it's like extending thing. And what they did was put a, a protocol in place where they would be broadcasting everything in one direction, right? So it's, uh, it's broadcast on the, on the downstream, and it's uh, TDMA, T TDMA on the upstream. So basically, the way it works is everything going out of, on this link is broadcast. Then there is a notion of something called the ONU ID. So each ONU here knows its ID. So if there's data to be sent to that particular ONU, it looks at the ONU ID and says, this is for me, and takes it. If it's not, it just discards it. Then there is the whole concept of upstream. So now in the upstream, you're doing something called TDMA. So this OLT is basically saying, I'm giving you a grant, send your data. And this is how much you can send. And this is the time at which you're going to send it. Then I'm going to give you a grant. This is the data. This is how much I'm going to send. So there's a concept of something called a dynamic bandwidth allocation algorithm that the OLT will run. And essentially, um, these guys will get a fair share of, uh, of the grants based on their demand. So what happens is each of these ONUs is reporting back a Q, Mac Q to the OLT saying, hey, I got so many packets for this class of traffic. So for instance, uh, you obviously want to give higher priority to real-time traffic like voice over data. Uh, you may have some constraints on video traffic versus uh, a file transfer. So all of that is reflected in something called a traffic class. And these guys will then send that, that report of their queues to the OLT, which then creates a master, um, uh, master schedule. So he says, OK, uh, I need to give this much grant to this ONU at this time. And so it's basically a pretty much a, a master scheduler that essentially this OLT is running across all of them. So uh, this is the basic way the whole pawn system works. Any questions, by the way? Just stop me. So again, basically, downstream is broadcast, upstream is TDMA, and the upstream TDMA slots are basically granted by the OLT to each of the ONU that basically sends it uh, based on a dynamic bandwidth allocation algorithm. The goal is fair share, so you need to make, and high utilization. So you want the link utilization to be as close to uh, unity as possible, and then fair share. Now what makes things interesting in the fair share piece is that these are all geographically located separately, right? So the round trip delay from here to here may be different from the round trip delay from here to here. So the OLT has to figure all that out. And there's a, a phase called the registration phase and the discovery phase. And it essentially, whenever a new ONU comes up, it sends its information to the OLT, which then figures out what the propagation delay is, where it is, and then registers the ONU. So there's a whole phase of uh, discovery and registration that um, 
that comes. So the new ONUs have to register, OLT responds back with an ONU ID, so now they have their own ID, and then the system is up and running. Uh, again, o ONUs can come in and go. It does not affect the tr transmission of data that's already in progress. So again, upstream is TDMA. The goal is to maximize the efficiency on the link, but also provide fairness. That's very important. So you don't want an ONU that's too far away from another ONU to be disadvantaged because of its location. So you've got to balance all of that. And ideally, the ideal DBA would actually do it on a per application basis. So. Uh, 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 video application running on your laptop may have a higher priority than um, uh, running Netflix, for instance, could have a higher priority than something that's running a bit torrent or something like that. But of course, to get to that level of sophistication, you need to keep adding more state in the information, and there's, there's a limit to how much you can do. But basically, what they've done is broken uh, into traffic classes. Each traffic class is called a TCONT, and the grants are done on a TCONT by TCONT basis. So you can say, you can have maybe four TCONTs, one for voice, one for real-time video, one for um, uh, non-real-time video, and the third, fourth one is just best effort data. And then you can give grants based on that. Uh, yeah. uh, so we actually, uh, the standards define multiple. So this is, um, Constant bit rate is voice, real-time video, uh, non-real-time video, best effort, uh, typical ways to do it. Uh, we ended up with two standards, which is unfortunate. Um, some history behind it. Uh, the, uh, the telcos had a committee called FSAN that would do uh, a PON, uh, which is based on what is called as GPON, uh, while the IEEE guys work on Ethernet frames, so they did something called EPON. So the uh, GPON is, you know, it's an ITU standard, it's 984 byte, uh, G.984, uh, IEEE was 802.3 EPON. What is the main difference? The main difference is uh, the telco guys came from the Sonnet world, so they had a concept of something called 125 microsecond frame. And the telco guys believed that what was going to be carried on that, uh, on that frame was a combination of Ethernet packets, um, ATM cells, and circuit switch TDM. Right? Uh, so they had to create something called a GEM, which is called a GPON encapsulation method, so that they could carry all these free traffic types. IEEE doesn't care about anything but Ethernet. They said, screw all this, we're just going to do Ethernet. So they only work with Ethernet, and essentially it's just Ethernet frames to Ethernet frames to Ethernet frames. Keep it very simple. Uh, these guys did it for 2.5 gig down, 1.25 up, because they were telco based, 2.5 was one of the sonnet um, uh, rates. Uh, IEEE only works at 10 megabits, 100 megabits, 1 gigabit, 10 gigabit, nothing in the middle. So this was designed for 1 gigabit. So you can see this is 2.4 down, uh, 1.24 up. And on the 10 gig, it was 10 gig down, 2.4 up. And these guys work with 1.25, 1.25. Uh, the 0.25 comes from the fact that they use 8B, 10B coding. So to get a one gigabit rate, they need to go to 1.25. And then uh, 1010 is their uh, next standard. So you had two different standards, uh, which is unfortunate because uh, you know, it basically fragments the market up. What Broadcom's done basically is our chipsets pro you know, support both of them. So you don't really have to decide, I want to do EPON or I want to do GPON. It's just a multiplexer inside our SOC that, that lets you decide. So, uh, yeah. uh, for example, let's say uh, Verizon, right? Yeah. can use a GPON, right? Yes. And then now, uh, the GPON is used, like, for example, by Cisco or 
Yeah, so uh, uh, the cable guys are using EPON in North America. The telcos are using GPON. The cable guys are using EPON. So right. Charter, Comcast are all EPON based. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the m main reason I think was, you know, um, GPON was viewed as a more telco standard. So the cable guys went to right. EPON. Right. Uh, anyway, so what's the main, uh, okay. So one uh, critical thing that I wanted to point out is what makes PON attractive is that uh, data traffic is bursty. So it's also self-similar. So uh, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon where you can take any time scale. If you look at the internet traffic, you can take any time scale and the pattern looks sort of similar. So it's what is called a fractal or self-similar. But uh, most of the bursts are small, but most of the bytes arrive in large bursts, right? So uh, it's kind of weird that you have small bursts, but when the burst comes, it comes with a very large thing. So if you had a fixed pipe, it becomes very inefficient because you can, two things are happening. Uh, the pipe is underutilized between the bursts, and the pipe is insufficient during a burst, right? So what makes um, PON attractive is the ability to instantaneously redistribute capacity between the bursts, uh, and that's the main advantage of all the TDMA-based upstream, uh, because you can essentially uh, very quickly move things around. Uh, so I'll give you an example, uh, an EPON with 10 gig aggregated capacity can actually perform better than 32 bits of aggregated capacity on a point-to-point -point thing. So it's kind of nice that it's bursty. Uh, we have a mechanism of quickly moving bandwidth around because of the DBA, and that allows you to sort of flatten, uh, just do a better utilization of the link bandwidth. So uh, that's an interesting uh, observation. Another thing is it tends to be green because uh, firstly it's all passive, so the electronics are all inside the, the thing. Uh, we have come up with very sophisticated schemes, so lasers are completely turned off. There's nothing to transmit. We have power savings mechanisms in the PON standard, uh, both on GPON and EPON. So essentially, uh, the, the power being used is very, very small compared to DSL or coax at this point in time. Uh, and again, the ability to share is, I think, uh, uh, very critical. So uh, you could see there's different technologies here. And uh, this is this is PON. This is power per user. And you can see uh, the different WiMAX here, HFC here. So you can see that, uh, essentially, it's pretty green. Uh, different generations of PON, so less than one gigabit, which was the original standard, was based something called APON or BPON, uses ATM as a better protocol, 60, 622 megabits down, 155 up. Then we moved to GPON, uh, which was 2.5 down, 1.24 up, and EPON, which was a symmetric one gig. Uh, now we're talking about 10 gig PON. Uh, XGPON 1 was 10 down, 2.5 up. Uh, XGS pawn is now 1010, and then on EPON we've got 101 EPON and 1010 EPON. And then the next generation is NGPON 2, which is can do up to 40 gig with four lamblers, and NG EPON, which is now doing 25 gig uh, um, serial. So the bandwidth is going up, and standards are 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 are. are Getting there to give you the. And we are at this time we are we are at 10 gigabits per second, right? right? At this time we are at 10. At 10 gig, second. yes, yes. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in my next slide. Uh, again, I don't want to spend too much time on this. The basic idea, what main difference was, GPON was based on this 125 microsecond window. EPON is just based on Ethernet frames. Uh, they have control packets called the OM, PDU, or MC. MPCP PDU that can be used in the middle. Uh, so there's no fixed framing for that. While here you can see that they were trying to do ATM 
So this is ATM plus gem, this is ATM only, this is gem only. Essentially, uh, unfortunately, both ATM and TDM as a native uh, form of transport were discarded. So it's only gem right now, uh, but you're unfortunately still stuck with this uh, encapsulation mode, while Ethernet, uh, EPON still only uh, Ethernet friends. Uh, uh, different classes of traffic, so GPON had class A, 20 dB, class B, 25, B plus at 28, C at 30, C plus. EPON did PX10 at 21, 23, PX20, now they've added PX30 and PX40. So they're getting to be similar. And coexistence was the other thing in EPON, if you want a 10 gig to coexist with a one gig PON, uh, the downstream are on different frequencies, but the upstream was shared. So here you're seeing, um, one gig downstream at 1490, 10 gig at 1577, but uh, the upstream, both one gig and 10 gig was being shared at 1270. But uh, GPON, on the other hand, needs four lambdas, so it needs two and a half gig downstream, 10 gig downstream, and <coughs> upstream. So three lambdas here, four lambdas here. Uh, again, these coexistence modes are very critical because you could have a 10 gig pawn where you could run 10 gig to the ser or business services and one gig or two and a half gig to the home. So residents can be lower speed, uh, uh, business can be higher speed, but they can be sitting on the same fiber essentially. Um, okay, let's talk about fiber access di dynamics. Um, Pawn's growing. Uh, I think 2017, more than 100 million units shipped. Uh, more than 2018, also more than 100 million ships. We shipped around 65 million last year. I mean, to think about it, that's more than a million a week, Broadcom alone. So it's just growing. And uh, I didn't do that, right? <laughs> uh, uh, also, uh, initial pawn deployment, there would be a modem and a Wi-Fi router sitting inside the house. It's all moving to one box now. So the modem and the router are all sitting inside the home. So it's going from a one box, uh, from a two box to a one box. Now wh what's the attractive about one box model? Firstly, the cost goes down because instead of two boxes, you're building only one box. And you're moving in inside the house so you can go from an outdoor install to an indoor install. But really the more critical thing that the carriers are discovering is that owning the gateway is owning the customer. So as you add more and more IoT devices inside the house, as you go towards a smarter home, the gateway suddenly becomes the hub that is controlling all these devices. And that's where, again, you're, you start monetizing on the software. Right? I think that's, that's the critical thing. Uh, so for instance, Today, we're seeing almost 100% Wi-Fi attach rate. So all our gateways are coming with the Wi-Fi. So if you, if you notice that, um, you know, you look at the Comcast box, or you look at the at and box into your house, it started with, uh, you know, Netgear Wi-Fi box that you bought from the Radio Shack. It's gone. It's all, it's all controlled by Comcast. It's all controlled by at and And uh, uh, good, because now suddenly you've control the, the home, bad, because suddenly you have all these home problems that you have to diagnose that you have not been, you have not trained your craft for. So most 90% of the problems the carriers are facing are Wi-Fi related problems. So uh, customer comes and says, hey, this is not working, my Wi-Fi is, the speed is down, what am I going to do? And it really needs to more in-home diagnostic. You need to have an ability to look at the Wi-Fi spectrums, see what's running, and provide an informed decision on where the problem is. So you uh, made the thing more complicated, more sophisticated, and you also added the diagnosis problem. So one of the, one of the critical things Broadcom does right now is, even though we are a VLSI company, spend a lot of time on the software to make the diagnosis of these problems simpler. Uh, 
Uh, again, I was also seeing uh, evolution to uh, extensions to home networking. We're seeing a lot of Wi-Fi meshes. A lot of the homes in, in um, North America, uh, the Wi-Fi doesn't reach every room. So you basically have a gateway, which is an access point, and then you have these two by two meshes sitting in different rooms. Uh, and then there are all kind of interesting problems on how to uh, distribute um, the traffic. Uh, and that's why there's an interest in a new standard called 11AX. It's also called uh, Wi-Fi 6. It has much better QoS and control than 11AC. We're seeing more and more 11AX designs coming up. Uh, this is an interesting topic in itself. Um, as this gateway becomes more and more um, sophisticated, you suddenly it starts becoming like a, your smartphone. You're going to be adding a bunch of software from third parties onto the gateway to control all these IoT devices, whether it's your uh, alarm or your um, you know, surveillance or whatever. Right now. In the past, the, the software that sat on the carrier was very secure, very safe, nobody could touch it, and really long lifetime, essentially. Suddenly you're bringing all these third-party software in and putting it on that same gateway. How do you protect the different softwares that are coming in on that gateway? Uh, if uh, one interesting ex uh, a demo we show on uh, in our um, broadband world forum or some of these trade shows is we actually take a um, third party software that has a memory leak in it and we download it through the cloud onto the gateway and if we don't have the protection the whole gateway crashes because of that leak now we put a linux container that we have uh, on, on our software stack you can see that the only that application dies the rest of the gateway is untouched and these are the kind of sophisticated things you need to bring into the table to make this happen. Um, we're also seeing, oh, sorry, we're also seeing more demand for uh, interoperability and uh, moving to higher broadband speeds. So we're seeing a lot of interest in uh, 10 gig pawn. We shipped almost 2 million 10 gig devices last year. So 10 gig is definitely growing. And we're definitely seeing uh, a lot of in investment in Pawn worldwide. I was just back, just back from Brazil. At least um, four carriers are fully going into Pawn with very advanced Wi-Fi on it. So clearly, you're seeing a, a lot of demand for high-end gateways. Um, so if you look at the different technologies, whether this is DSL, this is cable, this is uh, fiber, growth is mostly in fiber. Almost more than 25 percent year over year. Uh, growth is on fiber. Uh, again, applications, um, goal is universal service, services or fiber, so you've got a CO with the OLT, and then you can do fiber to the curb or fiber to the uh, distribution point, or you can do uh, fiber to the basement and go Ethernet, fiber to the basement, go DSL, fiber to the basement and go coax. Uh, or you can do business services all sitting on that same OLT, and then fiber to the, uh, this is backhaul, and then fiber to the host. So everything is essentially running on the same OLT, same fiber, different, uh, different technologies that are being used for the different markets, essentially. Uh, Broadcom does both sides, so we, again, you know, uh, we have the OLT, uh, the so 68620 is our uh, latest OLT, can do uh, all the variants of PON, um, HGS PON, 10 gig e PON, NG PON to G PON, E PON, and then 6858 is our uh, 10 gig home gateway, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then you can have the multiple models where you can have a two box model where there's a modem, and then a home router or a gateway where everything is integrated on one box. We just talked about that. And then a lot of different scenarios, uh, single port, uh, SFU, this is a layer two bridge outside the house, uh, an ability to get into the home and provide voice. Uh, home gateway, this is about 90% of the market right now. Uh, either single port or du double ports, it's 
basically a home gateway with Wi-Fi attached. Then you have Ethernet MDUs, VDSL MDU, G dot fast MDU. So pawn termination, fiber, and then out uh, DSL, small cell uh, with Femto. So you have a little small cell device here, uh, ability to actually move from uh, 4G into the small cell, uh, something that we provide. Uh, this is a cell backhaul unit, so this has all the timing needed to go from a packet-based network to a circuit switch-based network, and then the uh, Wi-Fi backhaul. And then some bridge applications. Um, and then again, I said, this is our mainstream business. Uh, um, terminate the pawn, e-pawn, g-pawn, uh, put Wi-Fi on it. We control the Wi-Fi completely here. We have a mechanism to offload the Wi-Fi onto our device, so uh, the, there's no CPU uh, loading due to the Wi-Fi, even though it's over PCIe. Uh, slick slacks for your, um, for your voice, USB 4 gigis. And, okay. Uh, so this is an interesting application. This is um, called fiber to the distribution point. You terminate the fiber, uh, put a DSL CO on, on on the distribution point and then goes to um, CPE in the home. Now these are typically uh, sitting in, in a, um, uh, you know, on the field in, in like um, uh, trenches and things like that. So they don't have any way to be powered. They're all sitting in pretty hostile environments. Let's see this one here sitting on a pole. So they've come up with a pretty clever method called reverse powering where the CPE is the one that powers the CO. So from the CPE, there's a way to bring the power in and, uh, and uh, power this entire unit. Now the challenge here is you may have 32 CPEs that this guy is talking to, right? Only one may be active at, at any given time and 31 may be off. That one has to power this whole thing. So bringing the power down on this device is very, very critical and that's what the whole reverse powering uh, does. And this is an, another interesting application. This is a pawn on a stick. So you put the ONU on a SFP stick, and then you can stick it into a, any Ethernet switch or any uh, uh, any NID, and essentially you're basically going from an Ethernet-based WAN to a PON-based WAN. So we did this. Um, here's the big challenge is this. Uh, the SFP form factor needs you to be less than two watts, so there's a lot of work done on the power to get to less than two watts max. But this is what that stick looks like. Software. So let me give you an example of how complicated this, these devices are. So this is our latest and greatest 10 gig um, SOC. So uh, on the fiber side, you, you have a choice of different pawns, uh, Mac. So 10 gig E pawn, XG pawn 1, NG pawn 2, G pawn active E, and there's a MUX. So you can pick which pawn technology you want to use. We have all on the on chip. And then on the LAN side, we have a choice of integrated gig 5 for your Ethernet, XFI, which is a 10 gig um, interface, uh, HSGMII, which is a 2.5 gig interface, or RGMII, which is a 1 gig interface, USB 3, a couple of them, uh, PCIe, this is needed for your Wi Fi. Uh, we typically Broadcom rights to do on chip regulators, so you bring in 3.3 volts, all the lower voltages are done on the chip. Uh, a nice uh, network, uh, nice CPU. This is a uh, ARM-based B53, about 14k DMIPS on this one, and a network processor that can is completely flexible. It's programmable, but can work at 10 gig speeds at 64 bytes. So this one does like 30 million packets per second. Uh, so you can see this is pretty much a very sophisticated system on a chip, and uh, running the software on it is critical. Now for us, uh, one of the key things we like to do is this network processor. So our data path is not in state machines. So it's not hardwired. It's all done on the network processor. And what this allows you to do is that you can take your CPE and put it in the field and you can 
add more and more functions in the data part as the need be or the carrier needs to with just a firmware download. You don't need to sort of do a, do a truck roll and bring this, uh, put a new VLSI chip in. It's all done in the network processor. And we've done some fantastic work on this network processor in terms of offloading the Wi-Fi or putting a speed test on this and things like that. So essentially what that means though is that we have an army of software developers that basically can take protocols, tunneling protocols and things like that, and what used to run on the CPU, push it down into the network processor to get the full uh, line rate. Uh, so that's a lot of resources that, 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 that is required. Uh, and this is our software stack. So it's Linux-based source code. This is our management stack, but you can replace it with something else like an OpenWRT or anything. It's also modular, so you can take your, you, we have our TR69 module, replace it with yours if you like. We have our SIP stack, you can replace it with, uh, with yours. Uh, but we spend a lot of time on, every time we get a new device in, we spend a lot of time optimizing it for performance. And uh, tight coupling at the software level is needed for all the devices that are sitting in the home, because the gateway is the key hub for the connected home. So that's why uh, we need to do something like this. These are Linux containers, so you can actually download these from the cloud using TR-157, which is a standard that Broadband Forum provides. So you can do containers. You can do an OpenWRT container or a Docker container or a Java container and just download it. And then we take care of ensuring that uh, the provider can provide priorities on these containers and more critically, we can ensure that uh, they are secure. So they, one container cannot affect the other one, as I pointed out. So if you have a smart home and you keep bringing in newer and newer devices, it comes with a third party software that runs on these devices. All of that can be put into a container and put in here and then you're guaranteeing that uh, you bring in some device it's not going to affect your voice service because that's protected. That's what the carrier owns. Uh, bring in, so it's really now become like a smartphone model sitting on the gateway because in the smartphone, we can go and download any app and you know, it runs most times. So that's, I think that's the goal and I think that's the vision. And so that's why the in-home diagnostics is very critical. Speed service is an interesting app. Uh, we run these Okla type speed services and when you're running it at like a couple of hundred, meg maybe less than 100 megabits or up to uh, a gigabit, it's okay. You move it past a gigabit and then you're in trouble because what happens with an uh, Okla type speed service is that the CPU is sending a byte and the CPU is receiving the byte. So when you do a speed service uh, test, what you're showing is the speed of the CPU it's got nothing to do with the speed of the underlying network that you're on, because if you run data traffic on an underlying network, the CPU doesn't touch it at all. It's all done in hardware, right? So you need to have a speed service that actually does what the system is actually doing. So what we did was we ran the speed service on our own U, uh, and we used a network processor to run the data on the network processor. So only the control is running on the CPU. So today, I think we're probably the only company in the world that can show you 1010 running on our ONU with 0% CPU utilization. They don't use the CPU at all. And for, the, for carriers, this is becoming very critical because uh, when you go into a market and you're bringing in 10, 10 gig services to the home, you better show your customer that you're giving him 10 gig because uh, somebody else is otherwise going to take, take that customer away. So this has become a huge, uh, huge value add that, that we're bringing to the table. Uh, the other thing we're doing is App ID. So basically, deep packet inspection essentially. So you essentially take a first few packets and send it to the CPU, establish a flow, and then run everything else on the network processor. Now this allows you to do something we call as quality of experience. Uh, where basically, for instance, if you were running a stream uh, to the home, 
and you're viewing the screen, uh, the touch stream on two devices. One was a laptop and the other one was a smartphone, right? Uh, you might want better quality on the laptop than the, uh, than the smartphone because, uh, you know, uh, getting, this allows you to do that. So the carrier is essentially able to see a bunch of, uh, you know, metrics like, uh, you know, uh, packet bytes, timestamps, bandwidth calculations, and it can essentially, the service provider can now target what goes where and what quality of service do you provide for the end application. And this is again going back to my point that you've got to start monetizing uh, your services and this is something that uh, we do. So you can do things like downstream bandwidth reservation, you can do latency prioritization, which is becoming very critical with video services. And um, there's this whole QoE engine that we, we bring to the table uh, with this app ID. Uh, app. So that's all I have. Happy to take any questions. Yeah. Uh, most of the deployment right now for the client is 1 to 32, uh, or we have also the 1 to 64. So it's actually, uh, 10 gig is moving up to 64 and 128. Right. Okay. Initially, uh, most of the GPON and EPON were around 32. Right. Yeah. But it's, go it's going up. It's, but right now, I mean, you have also the, I, mean, I saw that in the, in the slides, you had the 64. Yeah, now 128 is becoming common because a lot of them are moving to the C plus uh, transmit, you know, right. it's uh, like around 30 dBm. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, I think um, that's the name of the game is um, the higher the split ratio, you know, the more cost effective it becomes. Yes. Now, as far as the box, which is now, I mean, the, the, the O and U box, mm -hmm. which at the customer per, per, uh, per I mean, now, uh, who makes the box? You are not making the box. Yeah, so we have, um, we have, uh, yeah. So, companies like Alcatel Lucent or, um, uh, uh, which is Nokia now, or, um, f you know, ODMs like Foxconn. Uh, so they make the, yeah, they, they get your cheap basically yeah. with yeah. the yeah. Yeah. Because it's a very complex thing. So yeah, so it's actually now reaching an interesting point where, uh, the carrier is almost talking directly with us because the new features are all being added right. by the semiconductor right. company. I mean, the OM provides right. some level of support, but a lot of, I mean, so that's why for us, at least, I spend a lot of time talking to carriers because my software roadmap is completely uh, based on talking to them. Yeah. They need this, then we make sure yeah. we, we can. No, because electrical to optical is very I mean, really complex now. I mean, right. You have something yeah. like the laser to somehow send the stuff up, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. So that's what the yeah. yeah. is now. Yeah. Are there any questions? I was just wondering, like, when you have this 10 gig coming in, uh -huh. basically, you convert it into electrical signal, but then it all goes into the same chip? Or yeah. how do you demultiplex it? Like what is the range of each signal? Is it different? So um, there are two things that sit outside um, the chip. Uh, and there are two models. So there's a, something called a triplexer. So triplexer has three lambdas. There's a downstream lambda, there's an upstream lambda, and a third one which is called an analog video overlay lambda. So, the, so for instance, when Verizon did their Fios, uh, they wanted to retain that analog video, and so uh, there was one frequency and then two, two other frequencies coming in. Uh, what is common now is something called a diplexer. So essentially two lambdas coming out of the diplexer, one is downstream and one is upstream. It goes and feeds essentially into um, uh, what is called as a PMD chip, and then that converts the optical to electrical through a CDR 30. Uh, and, and puts puts that out. So uh, essentially, um, there is a filter that does the downstream versus the upstream, and then there's a, those are two different streams that go into um, uh, into the uh, PMD chip that converts it into an electrical signal. So it's all ten in, ten out, so, uh, and then. Um, once you get into electrical, it, it's, it's, it's a 
it's much easier. I mean, so. Yeah, it's interesting, right? So um, I was thinking about that. I mean, maybe um, get a G OLT into your lab. Maybe may not be ten gig. Maybe you can do it at two and a half gig or one gig, and then eight ONUs that we can connect to, you know, one on each station, and then start doing some experiments like, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Basic transmission is it working? Then start playing around with. Um, watch the registration protocol, what the discovery protocol. Get into what we call as um, data mode, where you can actually start. Put an Ixia on one side that comes back in, and then you can start uh, playing around with it. Uh, Ixia will actually allow you to choose the traffic types you want to put on that pipe, and then uh, start looking at scheduling priorities at the ONU. I mean, I, I can get very complicated very quickly, as you can see, but something like that could, could actually be fun. Can you change the software with the open data? Oh, yeah, 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 that's not a problem. Yeah. So, so our software is, um, our um, ONU software is all Linux-based, or all source code. So, um, Depending on what you're trying to do, we can actually definitely work through that. That's not a problem. Okay, there was uh, uh, yeah. question. question. Yeah. Oh, you're so nice. Thank you. I, I think you might have addressed this, but how many users can any given pond support? Yeah, so um, today the standard says up to 128. Uh, we typically started at around Eight to thirty-two, as he was pointing out. Again, it's a function of um, the budget. So you know the optics. I mentioned yeah, you want to, to go back it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, but you just yeah, yeah, you just need to hit the escape over there and then go out of here. Sorry, good, yeah. So, see, uh, this is where the crux is, right? So, every time you split, you lose 3 dB, yes. right? So, you can start with a very cheap class A solution, and that may support 8 users or 16 users. Or you can come with a C++ at 32 dB that's very expensive. And that can give you maybe 128 users. Right? So that's, so there are those two parameters you're working with, transfer power, split ratio, and the distance. So these are all defined for 20 kilometers. Right? You can come down to 10 kilometers and have same power but higher, higher split ratio. Makes sense. This is kind of the engineering you need to work with. Right. And now, uh, do you need any amplifier if uh, a fiber gets to become very long and you want to distribute it like maybe 64? Yeah, so these power budgets actually take care of that. So this is all defined up to 20 kilometers. Now, there's a concept of something called super pawn, which is 60 kilometers. Or something. And that actually does actually need active electro electronics in the middle to what is called as range extender. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And some people are working on that. Okay. All right, then uh, I would like to, it's now uh, 55, 55, 55. I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Rajiv uh, uh, Deep, uh, you know, who came here to us a very instructive uh, uh, talk. And uh, let's just give him a hand, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.